Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Plant Medicine Podcast. I'm Dr. Lynn Marie Morsky, your guide on this journey, and today we have the LSD History and Legality episode with Dr. Erica Dick. Dr. Dick is a professor in the Department of History at the University of Saskatchewan. Her work focuses on 20th century medical history, especially history of psychedelics, psychiatry, eugenics, and population control. Her books include Psychedelic Psychiatry, LSD from Clinic to Campus, and she's editor of A Culture's Catalyst, Historical Encounters with Peyote and the Native American Church in Canada. She's also co-editor of Psychedelic Prophets, The Letters of Aldous Huxley and Humphrey Osmond. Now, before we get on to what I'm sure is to be a fascinating discussion with Dr. Dick, just wanted to remind you that the Plant Medicine Podcast is for educational and informational purposes only. Nothing said on the podcast is to be construed as medical advice, so please see your own physician before beginning any type of regimen. Now, before with, well, you know what, I'm going to insert a commercial here and I'm not going to record that here, so this is where I insert the commercial, and then yeah. I will say, thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Dick. Thanks so much for having me. I am very much looking forward to this. LSD has such an interesting history. Uh, there is, you know, the military use that we've all kind of heard a little bit about and and how it was initially synthesized and used, and then all of a sudden we couldn't use it anymore. And so I'm just very excited to have this chat. If we could start by having you tell us a little bit about how you got into this line of research. Yeah, it's sort of not entirely interesting story. I was doing my doctoral research at, uh, at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And I was really interested in the history of psychiatry. And what particularly drove me to this project was an interest in how Saskatchewan, so the place that I'm now living and the place where I grew up, how this province in Canada uh, invested in the first public health care system in North America and where LSD experiments fit into that. So why was this place the home to some of the largest and most internationally significant LSD experiments in the 1950s? Interesting. Okay. Well, now we've, I just read off your bio with all these very cool books. That, so let's dive in. Can you talk a little bit about how LSD was first synthesized and its very early history? Yeah, so LSD is first synthesized in 1938 in Switzerland by an organic chemist named Albert Hoffman but it wasn't experienced until April 1943. It was the first time that he spilled some on his hand and had the first, the first experience. And some of this has been sort of memorialized in his own books, but other people have also riffed off of this history. They, you can hear maybe about his famous bicycle ride where he talks about this, you know, this liquid or this chemical had fallen onto his hand. And uh, after about an hour, he was starting to feel a bit dizzy, a little bit nauseous. So he got on his bicycle and went home and he felt that he'd been plunged into a Salvador Dali painting. He started having hallucinations, vivid colors, there were sensations that were changing around him. As he got home, he was worried that he may have actually permanently damaged his mind. He was quite concerned that he may have actually caused some kind of mental illness or breakdown. So he locked himself in a room and was worried about his children finding him like this. But of course, a few hours went by and he started to actually quite enjoy the experience and kind of sort of relaxed into it, if you will. And this plunged him into a really wonderful and uh, colorful journey of self-discovery over the next many, many years as he became very, very much enthralled with what this strange chemical might offer. He was not a clinician. He was not, a, he was not able to give this to people as in a clinical trial, but um, Sandoz Pharmaceuticals, which, had, which employed him, made this drug available to researchers and it triggered a whole host of research such that there were about a thousand peer-reviewed publications in scientific and medical journals um, by the end of the 1950s. Wow. Now, how did it go from that point where, you know, we've got the clinical use and then the 60s comes along and mm -hmm. the use goes to much more recreational? What, what were some of the leading forces in that transformation? Yeah, so... It, if it's all right to back up just for one second, um, some of the leading research that was going on and the work that I look at in Saskatchewan began in 1951 and it goes for about a decade. And at that time, the research was really 
it was sort of under the radar in some respects in the, in the sense that it wasn't on the front pages of newspapers. We didn't talk about acid. The word psychedelic was coined by the psychiatrist in Saskatchewan in 1956, was the first time he introduced the word. So it's very early days as they're trying to figure out what these chemicals do or what these psychoactive experiences are teaching us, if anything, who should take them, what the doses should be. They're working out a lot of those kinds of things. Um, it's the correspondence between Humphrey Osmond, who was a British trained psychiatrist working in Saskatchewan, and Aldous Huxley, who was already a well-known author at this point, who was living in Los Angeles, is their correspondence that leads to the word psychedelic. To fall in hell or soar angelic, he'll need a pinch of psychedelic. And that was the first time they wrote that in, in letters back and forth to one another. Humphrey Osmond wrote it first. Um, and it was introduced in the New York Academy of Sciences meeting in 1957. So it very much had a clinical connotation to it initially. And that, of course, transformed very, very significantly over the next decade. So the early research that they were doing, at least the, the, the research in Saskatchewan, which gets picked up in a variety of other places throughout North America, they concentrated on two things in particular. One was to create a model psychosis. So that was the idea that by taking LSD, you could understand what it was like to have schizophrenia. You could understand psychosis from the inside, not just as a theoretical concept or not something that you witness or observe through other people, patients usually. And Humphrey Osmond was really convinced that his schizophrenic patients were amongst the most marginalized people anywhere, that they had such difficulty expressing their feelings and their thoughts that people tended to write them off entirely or assume that whatever they were saying had no logic to it. He said, by taking these, by having these experiences and experiencing what it was like to have difficulty communicating a hallucination or to not know whether to trust a delusion or hallucination and to not sort of your, your whole sense of your environment or what's real and what's not is tampered with. He said this was an incredibly valuable experience. He suggested then that psychiatrists, psych psychologists, social workers and nurses should be taking this drug to generate a kind of chemically inspired empathy. So not as a treatment really, but as a device for better caring and more appropriate care for people with psychosis, which I think is a pretty noble idea. And it really flies in the face of the kinds of modern healthcare options we have today where you can't imagine your physician taking a drug with you in order to understand your whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely not. The second piece of it was they started very quickly moving from the model psychosis into alcoholism treatment. We might think of it more broadly as addictions treatment, but really the focus in the 1950s was on alcohol or problem drinking. And the idea was that by taking LSD and sometimes mescaline, which also came into the family of psychedelics, uh, by taking these drugs, you could simulate the experience of hitting rock bottom or change someone's perspective sufficiently that they could start to seek help and appreciate the kind of help they were receiving rather than rejecting it. And it actually really matches with some of the literature and some of the discussions that came out of Alcoholics Anonymous as well. So Alcoholics Anonymous, of course, wanted everyone to be abstinent and they didn't want people taking LSD or any kind of drug to help them on the road to sobriety. But this was kind of different because it was a one one interaction, so one hit of LSD, most of the hits were quite massive, but nonetheless, one of these experiences was later described as worth 10 years of psychotherapy. And for some people, that experience of having a, a psychedelic moment, if you will, or psychedelic trip, I mean, these are more modern words that we associate with it, it also helped people to just see themselves differently to generate some perspective on the way that they had been behaving, whether it was a reaction to trauma or a desire to fit in or all sorts of other kinds of insecurities that were often driving the drinking. So it wasn't just a focus on the drinking itself. Many people also had what they described as spiritual experiences. And this was something that got a lot of people very interested in. How could this chemical create a sort of God molecule is what one author calls it. Um, how does spirituality fit into the healing enterprise, which now, if we fast forward to the 1960s, so this research went on for about 10 years. Lots of units were picking it up throughout the United States and England, throughout much of Europe. And there was a lot of momentum. Some of the addictions facilities were su suggesting that psychedelics had the greatest impact on reversing addictions or in helping people transition into a different kind of lifestyle. So it's hard to sometimes call it a cure. 
Um, but there were certainly people who described their lives as much improved. Some research units even had 90% much improved category over the course of two years. So two years since a single hit, and they felt that people had re returned to work. They sometimes um, fixed their family relations, so got back together with their wives. These were almost all men in the study. <laughs> Um, but their lives were appreciably improved according to them. Beginning in the 1960s, um, some of the research starts to kind of leak into other places. So there are research units who are trying new techniques and some of the ethical protocols might have been even a little bit more relaxed. Although if you imagine that one of the protocols is taking the drug yourself as a researcher, it's not a, a far cry to imagine this going off the rails a little bit. In 1961, 62, so December to January, Timothy Leary was fired from Harvard for his allegedly unethical use and application of mushrooms or psilocybin. And there's a dramatic change from throughout the 1950s where people are talking about LSD mostly in scientific circles or in medical circles. It's not really in the popular press. And after Leary leaves his position at Harvard, not by choice, uh, he gets involved in a whole variety of very colorful antics. And he sort of, I've described him as sort of a self-appointed cultural guru. And it, he makes it his raison d'etre, if you will, to be on the front page and to suggest that actually everyone should take LSD. Perhaps we should put it into water supplies. Newspaper reports start moving stories from LSD from the science column or the health column into the front page. And over the course of the 1960s, beginning in about 1965, 66, we see a dramatic shift in articles coming out of the front page. They're coming under police stories. They're talking about abuse. They're talking about suicide and murder that may or may not have been associated with LSD. But you start to see this connection really forging strongly. And it coincides with a rise, a, a dramatic rise in what we now know is black market LSD or black market acid. So the researchers kind of lose uh, the genie's out of the bottle, if you will, or they lose control over how to maintain con like physical control over these substances, but also the, the, the circumstances by which people are taking these drugs is no longer confined to a, a medical or health setting, and, and things really, really change dramatically. And I'll say one last thing on that before I let you ask another question. Um, Sandoz Pharmaceutical Company, of course, was very concerned about the reputation both of the company but also of their particular drug, which they still were the sole proprietor for. And they started doing investigations on campuses, uh, primarily in California, looking at the kinds of drugs that were being sold as acid. And what they found was that there were dozens, in fact, I think one report suggested there were at least 62 other kinds of things that were being sold as acid that were not LSD. Wow. So they may cause hallucinations or they may cause all sorts of side effects, um, but they didn't even know what people were taking. And they were worried that they were going to be blamed for wreaking havoc on a generation, if you will. And uh, they withdrew their supplies at that time. And you start to see convictions go up quite dramatically. And this puts a lot of pressure on researchers, of course, to take sides in, the, in this really melee. Yeah. And what were the – so at this time, it's still not – Illegal, correct? The time, the time it's still, about? By 1962, there's a lot of concern about who has access to these drugs. And they start to, both, the, uh, both in the United States and in Canada, there are restrictions placed on who can get legal access. So it has to go through a medical research unit. It's interesting to see sometimes there are people I know now, uh, we can see this historically, who fake their credentials in order to get copies of this. But there are also people who learn how to make LSD and start providing other kinds of supplies. So that's where we start to see this black market. Some of it is d lysergic acid diethylamide. You know, it meets that chemical quality, um, but it is not coming from Sandoz. And so you got a real kind of uh, flooding of the market. People are also taking a lot of other drugs that are on the market at this time too. So it's difficult to tease apart whether people are taking acid or whether they're taking speed with a little bit of acid and maybe a bit of marijuana later in the day. You know, and the reactions there produce a very different effect. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So this is now we're pre-scheduling, we're pre-DEA scheduling, but it is yeah. it's at a place where it is like prescription only, essentially, or through research only. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's not something you take home. Gotcha. <laughs> These gotcha. are all done in clinical settings, at least the legal ones. Yes. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Now, 
Somewhere in there is the famed military experiments. Can you talk a little bit about those? Yeah, so a few historians and, and journalists have written about the military experience experiments rather that were done primarily in the United States, but we know now that there were some of these things going on in other places as well. And of course, those records have been restricted. Some of them have been destroyed. So there are pieces of the story that have come to light now, and I'm sure that there's much more of the story that may never come to light. What we know about them um, primarily comes from uh, John Mark's work on the search for the Manchurian candidate where he found a box of records that were supposed to be destroyed, but they weren't by some fluke or mistake. Um, and inside, he discovered a whole variety of CIA operatives that were specifically designed to test LSD on unwitting soldiers or unwitting spies. And the logic here, so this was in the late 1940s, and it, it's before we start to see the, the medical research really take off. There are bits and pieces of it, but it doesn't really sort of galvanize into a medical movement, if you will, until a few years later. The military experiments are kind of interesting. If we think of them just as LSD, you imagine it's the Cold War, so there's real concern, heightened concern about spies and how are you going to identify who's a spy and what will you do if you encounter a spy? And so the, the idea was that they could use LSD as a truth serum, that somehow by dosing people, they would be, you know, they would succumb to the truth and they would, they would need to reveal their true identity. Um, they did not just test LSD, they tested marijuana, they tested different kinds of alcohol, they tested different doses, different quantities, um, LSD. It didn't work. It did not reveal an inner truth. Uh, many people felt that it was revealing a kind of truth, but not in the, in the spirit of the Cold War espionage, the work that was going on. Much of that was abandoned, but it was also, it already had sort of titillated users or attracted a following such that people started looking for LSD and there are stories, quite dramatic stories of CIA um, holiday parties where people had spiked the punch. Um, and this is where the famous story comes where one of the one of the officers ends up committing suicide. Now there are other stories suggesting that he may have committed suicide even without a spiked punch, but some of those, some of the truth of that may be lost to history. Interesting. Okay. So thank you for covering that. We've gone through the forties <laughs> and the fifties and now yeah. we're in the sixties and mm. thanks to Timothy Leary and some other people, there's significantly wider spread use. Like you said, some of it, not necessarily LSD, but uh, we've got yeah. LSD out there. What happens between then and when it becomes criminalized in, I believe the, is it the early seventies? It, it sort of depends on where you are. So in California, there's a law passed by the California state government to, uh, I don't know if they use the word criminalized, but it's definitely a restricted substance by 1966. And it's partly in reaction to some of the things that are going on on campuses in the United States. Now, cynical historians like myself have suggested that, you know, this may have actually not had very much to do with LSD or acid or even for that matter, marijuana or dope or anything. Um, but there were also significant student protests going on on those campuses. And this is not unique to California, but the anti-Vietnam War protests, the free speech movements, they all kind of culminate around the same time period. And if there is a way to write those off or to discredit them by claiming that these students were all taking drugs. It's sort of a clever device. And so there's a really interesting sort of convergence of policing attitudes or authority, you know, different kinds of authorities, whether it's President Nixon declaring a war on drugs or whether it's local officials suggesting that students are behaving in unruly ways and it must be explained because they're, it's justified because they're on drugs or it's rationalized because of their drug use. So by making drug use prohibited or criminalizing it, you also then stamp out some of the activities. And, you know, it, it's difficult to tease those apart, I think, and say it's necessarily the drug use or it was necessarily the Vietnam War that caused this. Um, but historians have tried to grapple with that and try to understand the relationship between the rising tide of social unease and frustration and, you know, civil rights protests, really, that start to challenge the government in particular ways and the government responds by criminalizing or prohibiting these drugs or hospitalizing people or putting them in jail. So it, it's a messy, tangled mess. Um, but there are certain laws that come into play. So California becomes kind of a battleground for some of these things. And they also had a number of medical units, particularly in Los Angeles in the Veterans Hospital, where there were key researchers doing uh, LSD work there as well. In Canada, um, the laws change in 1962. The first law comes into place that puts LSD on a restricted schedule. 
So it moves it into a new schedule where only bona fide researchers can get access to it. In 1966, it changes again, and it squeezes that down a little bit further. So you have to apply directly through the health minister, and there's even more surveillance over those applications. To 1968, when the Canadian government responds to the World Health Organization's plea to have LSD completely criminalized. The United States is slightly different. Those trials continue on for a little bit longer. Um, there's a group at Spring Grove Hospital in Baltimore that continues to do LSD experiments into the 1970s. And there are loopholes in the law that allow them to continue absolutely legally. It gets more challenging to get access to those supplies and to conduct the kind of research they're interested in. Um, but legally, it's not entirely squeezed out of existence. You can't possess it. You can't sell it. You certainly can't take it on campuses at this point. Um, but medical researchers still had access to it for a little bit longer. Gotcha. And then... Rambling so much. That, no, you're good. You're good. And and so at some point, then we have the... the I'm, I'm going to forget the name of the act that led to the DEA. And then, yeah, like the Harrison Act or something. Yeah. Yes. But that's what finally gets it to where, like, at least in the U.S. nationwide, it mm. is now Schedule 1. Right. Yeah. Despite the so, fact that, like, go yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, 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 I was going to say, there, there's a great historian who's just released a book on this called uh, Psychedelic Trials or the Trials of Psychedelics, where he walks through a very detailed case by case to show how that changes in the United States and how this changes the nature of medical research. And it also kind of changes the questions that medical researchers can ask of the drugs that they're testing. It's not exclusive to LSD, of course, but it becomes sort of the canary in the coal mine. Yeah, like we are seeing kind of the undoing now of what's going on with a lot of research trying to prove, because Schedule 1 says that there's no medical, no, you know, what, what do they ever say? Like no verified yeah, medical no use. Benefit. Yeah. <laughs> and high addictive potential and so we've got you know like with lsd and psilocybin we're seeing all of these investigations going on all the research trying to get, get them back into their rightful place of okay you know there is a medicinal use this should not be on schedule one and you and i were talking a little bit before we started because we know with with mushrooms okay in the netherlands there's you know they're like open out in the open facilities where you can get mushrooms and Ibogaine, you can go down to Mexico. There's like different things you can do in different places. And so I asked you where, if anywhere, is LSD legal? And you said? There are a number of medical trials going on with LSD, psilocybin, uh, MDMA. I, I should I should revise that. Not so much with LSD. LSD still remains something that whether I think is again a, a combination of legal factors as well as there are there are many sort of deeply held assumptions about the power of LSD or the danger is the inherent dangers of taking LSD. So I think there's a variety of reasons why researchers have tended to sort of steer away from that, whether writing a grant application claiming that you're going to do LSD research, you might be a bit more nervous about that than if you use psilocybin or something else. There's a whole variety of factors, some of which I think are more social than they are legal or political. Nonetheless, the psychedelic research that's unfolding today and at quite a pace um, tends to be focused on slightly different psychedelics. So MDMA or we might say ecstasy, although you know researchers will not want to say that, uh, ayahuasca or DMT, ibogaine, ketamine. There are other kinds of substances that are now seen or, or understood to be producing similar kinds of effects. The duration is sometimes different. There's also microdosing, of course, but there are a variety of people now testing these things in legitimate medical facilities and in legitimate, um, you know, not necessarily with human subjects in all cases, but increasingly now with human subjects as well. It's really been in the last 10 years, maybe even 12 years. What year is it now? Right. <laughs> About <It's> 2020. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just heard it. I yeah, it's, it's probably been about 12 years where we've started to see things shifting. And it's remarkable. I mean, I finished my research on this about 2007. And you know, thought, as a good historian, you know, that's the end of things. And it's history. Um, and things have really changed in the last decade. There are more questions being asked. And there's a return to questions around whether or not schedule run is, in fact, the, the appropriate place for these, as you alluded to, that maybe there are medical benefits that have been overlooked. And Things, questions about addiction have been really, really thrown um, up in the air. LSD and psychedelics have never been described as causing addiction in any of the medical language or any of the medical studies. They have certainly been described as addictive 
my non-medical studies, um, but people who were doing the research found that this was not the case. In fact, most of the trials, many of the trials, I would say the vast majority of them, found that a single interaction was what was required. So these weren't even the kinds of drugs that, you know, I should, I want to just back up for just one moment and say, at the time that LSD started coming into the medical community with more uh, regularity, I suppose, in the 1950s, this decade was also the period where the most psychopharmaceuticals entered the marketplace. So at the same time that LSD is being tested, and we might think of it, of it as being kind of strange or radical or different, there were other kinds of pharmaceuticals and psychopharmaceuticals in particular really pouring into the market, and they operate in a very different way. Physicians were not necessarily taking antipsychotic medications or antidepressant medications in order to understand their patients. And patients were being brought into a system where they are expected to take a drug for the rest of their lives. It's an absolutely different economic model and is a very different model for thinking about things like resurrecting independence or patient autonomy or personal autonomy. You may not even think of a person as a patient in this context. Whereas LSD, the whole interaction was designed to give that person the kind of power or insight that they needed to go on their own healing journey. It's a very different model and a very different philosophy. And I think that, I believe that some of that philosophy also clashed with a growing pharmaceutical industry that had a vested interest in making sure that they could patent and sell as many pharmaceuticals to people who would take them every day. Yeah, that's a very not valid a, point. <laughs> what did you say? Not a single dose. I'm not even a cynic at all. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I appreciate that point of view because I, that that's a great paradigm for us to look at is like this these two things were happening in parallel and one of them clearly had a profit motive or, or a profit structure that we yeah. keep giving and lsd did not you know that the one and done is not great for, for longevity <laughs> precisely and i think what we're seeing now too so if we imagine in the 1950s these all of these things are happening in tandem as you say and now in 2020 it's a great year for hindsight if we reflect on these things we can also see that those other pharmaceutical interventions have not produced cures. We don't actually see a reduction in the number of people suffering from mental illness. We, in fact, see a dramatic rise. When we see pharmaceutical companies that have really benefited financially and they are politically powerful, more so, much, much more so than they were 70 years ago. So I think it's an interesting moment to pause and reflect on what does it mean to stamp out a particular philosophy or mode for understanding health and healing that may not be for everyone? I don't want to suggest that, you know, if only everybody had this, we'd all live wonderful lives. I don't think that's the case. Um, but I do think that by blocking a particular way of interacting with our own health and our own understanding of what we need to heal, um, it really changes and creates a dependence on a particular kind of economic model that, I don't think has been beneficial for people with mental illness. Yeah, I appreciate that that input, that insight there, because that's definitely going forward. We have to look at what's what what's being done for profit and what's actually going to benefit the patient. And right. Yeah. And I hope that that is taken into consideration as all these psychedelic chats move forward. Um, yeah. So so to clarify, though, outside of these studies that are being done, LSD is legal nowhere. Correct. There is no, okay. As far as I know. <laughs> as far as we know, there is nowhere that LSD is legal. So note to everybody listening. <laughs> outside yeah. of, yes, keeping this on the, the, the very clear terms, nowhere is LSD legal. Because it's, you see like, oh, microdosing LSD everywhere as if it's like somehow quasi-legal. It doesn't matter what the dose is, still not legal um, at this point. But like you said, you know, the first step to getting something into a legal framework where it can be used as a medicine is to undergo these trials that are starting to pop up little by little. Absolutely. It was very exciting, I think, for, for those of us who've been watching these stories. And, um, you know, as a historian, I'm, again, sort of reflecting on this. And I am not a clinical researcher. I am not engaged in any clinical trials. I've, I don't have insight into that other than what anybody can gain access to through the public record. What's really interesting is to start to see changes on the landscape. For example, um, I think it was about six or seven months ago, there's a new research 
uh, unit at Johns Hopkins University that is now devoted specifically to psychedelic research. And that came with a $17 million donation. It's very interesting to see that that can happen in today's day and age. And I don't, I can't imagine that happening even 15 years ago. So I think that it is, it does reveal a shift in our attitudes towards these drugs or toward, and I do think it's twinned. I think it's both a relaxing of our perhaps fears around psychedelics, but I think it's also a frustration with the lack of, of some kind of, um, you know, we haven't seen a lot of improvement. We haven't seen, forget cures, we haven't necessarily seen the eradication of suffering that was promised with some of these other kinds of interventions. And so I think it's kind of a, a joint venture here where, you know, this isn't working, why don't we try something else? And I want to just, if it's okay to, to say one other thing, I don't know how this is in the United States, but certainly in Canada, we are um, deeply engaged in a process of reconciliation. And it takes on different shapes and forms, and we can be critical of its lack of success, perhaps. Um, but there is an attempt to try to recognize the, our colonial past and to make amends or understand and appreciate the role that Indigenous people have played in our history and the ways in which they have been systemically marginalized. One of the things that I think is also very interesting is to remember that element and the ways in which Indigenous spiritual uses and Indigenous plant-based medicines had been sort of pushed out of mainstream or orthodox healthcare and healing. And there's a lot of things that we could learn from paying attention to some of those practices that were pushed aside or have been laid dormant and were described as you know, unethical or criminal even, we actually have a lot to learn from the ways in which they ritualize healing, which has a lot in common with the ritualized use of, of psychedelics. We see this especially in the Brazilian rainforest when we see the uh, ayahuasca trials that are going on in the ayahuasca ceremonies, and we also see the abuse that that can cause if people are kind of ayahuasca tourists as opposed to participating fully in an appreciation of the interaction between plants and human bodies. But I think that this is also a moment where there is a desire to try to think about those colonial tensions that have shaped our history, and that might be another feature that will help us to maybe reconcile or at least appreciate a different kind of relationship going forward. And I mean, Australia is on fire right now. We know that climate change concerns are also under, under uh, they're running throughout these conversations as well. And I think these actually are kind of conjoined issues. If we think about the relationship with plants and the relationship with the planet, there's a lot of energy and focus on that now. And I think these things come together in ways that are not just about a clinical trial going on at Johns Hopkins, but really are integral to the ways in which we're thinking about the future. Yes. Thank you very much for Sorry, adding that. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. I like so <laughs> you, you have it. The soapbox is yours. We have <laughs> upcoming episodes with um, the people from Chakruna, who you may have heard of, who are very vested like in, that. yeah, in, in maintaining and restoring some of those ancestral mm -hmm. and tribal and indigenous wisdom practices back with, mm -hmm. with the current, um, the, the current goings on in psychedelia. And then also, if anybody is new to the podcast, and this is one of the first episodes you're hearing, uh, scroll back on up to the psilocybin episodes because we have Dr. Albert Garcia Romeo from the Johns Hopkins Center for Psychedelic oh. and Consciousness Research talking about what they're doing there. So thank you for the, you know, the segue. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Dick, where can people find your work? Thank you so much for sharing everything you've shared. And, and I'm sure people, especially like, you know, we just talked about LLC, but you've got the, the, I think, like you said, the, the, it was peyote, right? The other book that, yes. And so if people are interested to, to read more, um, can they find these on Amazon? Absolutely. All of this stuff is on Amazon or contact me directly and I can figure out the Canadian laws. <laughs> 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 I love it. Very generous. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. For everybody else out there, until next time. Yeah.